I'm here to present on a posteriori taint tracking for demonstrating non-interference in expressive low-level languages, which is a little bit complicated. So if you prefer, you can call it faster automated proofs that information doesn't leak in Android applications. But I do mean every word of this. Um, what we're doing here is taint tracking after we've done a static analysis, and it's in a Dalvik bytecode, which is an expressive low-level language. By expressive, I mean a language that has things like functions and exceptional flow. So ultimately, the, answer, the question we want to answer is, well, what happens to my information? My password, my GPS data, whatever. I mean, phones have access to a lot of stuff. It's kind of scary. And so we, we're trying to, to, to put a bound on where this information can go and prove that it's not going to unsafe places. So we start with the work that Denning and Denning did in the 1970s. They started with taint flow analysis, which is kind of the, the digital equivalent of putting dye in a pipe and seeing where it goes. So you assign a taint to a value and then propagate that taint throughout, uh, throughout the program. Um, you know, taint flow analysis is a dynamic analysis and we want something that's fully static and we want something that allows us to prove something for all possible executions of a program. And the work that Denning and Denning did also is, was written and applied to simple languages that lacked functions and had very clear uh, syntactic bounds on the extent of branches and things like that. And so we also wanted to, to apply this to a modern language that has functions and exceptions and so on. And so what we did is we took the work of Denning and Denning and we applied the work of Cuzo and Cuzo. That is, we put our dynamic analysis inside of a small step abstract interpreter. And this magically becomes a static analysis. But we did it, we didn't know if it actually did what it purported to do. So to, ask, to, to determine whether or not it does what it, it does, what we, want it, what we want it to do, we needed to have a formalism that describes the property we want. So we call this non-interference. Um, non-interference formally is that no sensitive information may affect the, beha the observable behaviors of a program. So if we're worried about GPS data leaking, and we're worried about it leaking to the network, then non-interference means that if we have some program trace with the GPS da uh, datum that is represented by a green square, and it goes through and it does some things, and then we run the program again, and the only difference is that we have a blue star for our location, that this program must do exactly the same things. We also need a model for our computation in semantics. So our model is a CESK machine. Uh, many of you are going to be familiar with this. C, E, S, and K refer to the different components of a program state. It's a snapshot of where we are in the program and what, has, uh, what the values in memory and so on are. So C is control or where we are. It's the expression or the line number or something like that. Environment is sort of like our, our local stack frame. Um, or it's a mapping from variables to addresses. The store is like our, mo our model of memory. It's a mapping from addresses to values. And the continuation is like our program stack. For those of you who live in the imperative world, you might be more comfortable with instruction registers, heap, and stack, which are roughly equivalent to what we're doing. So we take all of this, and we bundle it up, and we put it in this, this one state at the top. And then we calculate from there. Using that state, we can calculate its successor, and then so on and so forth. But this is, this is a concrete analysis, and that means that it can diverge. It can go forever. And it's only exploring one execution through the program. And so what we have to do is we have to take our C, E, S, and K, and we have to abstract them. Abstraction allows us to represent multiple concrete, uh, concrete states with a single abstract state. Um, and this solves several problems. It allows us to look at all possible program executions, and it also allows us to prove termination. So one key bit of abstraction is that we're abstracting to a domain that is guaranteed to be finite. And actually, thanks to Van Horn and Might and their abstracting abstract machines work, we know all we need to do is abstract the individual components. So for example, the store maps from abstract addresses, which are from a, a finite set, to abstract values, which are also from a finite set. So we have some abstract state, and that abstract state may have multiple successors. That's fine we can explore this non-deterministically. And they may merge back together. They may have the same successor, and it can branch out again. And it can even loop back on itself. But because of the nature of this type of interpretation, 
this, the, because each state, CESK, encapsulates all of the information about what's going on in a program, we won't discover any new information by re-exploring the same state. And so we just say, okay, I've seen this, I'm good. Um, now we need to add some machinery so that we can track taint. So we add in a taint store. In the same way that the store maps addresses to values, the taint store maps addresses to taint values. And in this presentation, our taint values are simple Booleans, although they can be more complex, and that goes all the way back to the work by Denning and Denning. So when we have some program that's copying a secret value onto X, secret gets a taint on it, and when we copy it onto X, we copy this onto X's address in the taint store. That works great until we start branching. Right? If we want to prove the absence of any information flows, we have to deal with all the information flows. And we can do subtle things like in this little Java excerpt where we branch on secret and then assign constants to x. And the, the result of this program is that we've copied secret onto x. But at no point have we done that in a way that's observable to our system as it exists right now. So we have to add on yet another piece of machinery, a set of branches where we've, we've diverged our control flow based on sensitive information. I'll also call this the context taint set. And this is nothing more but a set of, of, of code points. So now back to our example. Now we have this thing in the corner that we're keeping track of where we've branched. So when we branch at zero, on line zero, we add that to our context taint set. And then on line one, we're going to create an implicit taint value that says we branched at zero and then assigned something at line one. Similarly on line three, branch at zero, assigned on line three. But the problem is we're also going to do this to y. Even though all of us in the room can, by inspection, say this is safe, our system as it exists is going to uh, assign a taint to it. Happily, we have Denning and Denning to come to the rescue. Denning and Denning actually suggested that we just use the control flow graph. What we can do is we can calculate the post dominator, which I'll explain, and and we can use this to, to determine what is and isn't safe. So we already have an abstract state graph, and we can project this graph to create a control flow graph. Of course, when we're projecting, we may have multiple states that are the same, and so they'll merge together. But we have this new graph, and we look through, and we've got maybe one route, we've got another route, we can loop back. And post-dominance looks at all of, the, all of the routes from some node, in this case the top node, to the exit node, and every single path coming from that, that top node that goes to the exit node, must go through this one in the middle. And that is the first one that has that property, so we call it the immediate post dominator. And this is the point at which we know our control flow must always have converged at this point, and so we know that it's safe to do assignments. So back to this example, we can go from line 0 to 1 to, to 4, or we can go from line 0 to 3 to 4. And those are the only paths through this program, and so we know that we'll always go from 0 to 4, and so once we reach 4, we know we're safe. And so what we do is we ignore this taint value because we know we branched at zero and assigned at five, and five is past that immediate post dominator. Okay, now you have to abstract it. We already know how to abstract the CES and K. The taint, taint store is very easy to abstract because it's just going to have abstract, taint abstract addresses and abstract taint values. And in the case of Booleans, there are only two, and two is finite. So we don't even have to do anything with, with this trivial uh, taint value system. And the branches, because they're just a set of code points, and code points are finite because the size of the program is one of the parameters to our, our um, analysis, we don't actually have to abstract that at all. And so, okay, we have an analysis. And now we come back to the question of, does it work? And the answer is almost. And since this workshop and the, the symposium generally are about breaking stuff, I'll show you exactly how we do it. So this is a Java program again, and, and all of these techniques apply to Java or Java bytecode or what, what have you. So we have some private secret value, and this is what we're going to try to exfiltrate. So we design a function where we call it with frame zero, and this refers to how, far, how deep we are in the stack. So we call it with frame equal to zero, and then immediately recur with frame equal to one. So now, and, we're, and imagine we're doing this on two separate executions, one where secret is true and one where secret is false. So again, we've got our base frame is zero, and then our current stack frame, frame is one. If secret is true, then we're going to immediately return, and if it's not, we're going to continue on. Now you notice in both of these executions, we're going to be after this if-else block. 
So we're at the same point in the control flow graph, but we're at different stack heights. And so frame is zero in one case and one in the other. So we exploit this, we print not if frame is one, and then we print true in both cases, and we've printed not true when secret is false and true when secret is true. And we've done it in a way that all of this machinery we've just des designed doesn't, doesn't catch. So we need to come up with something else. The problem is that we projected to a, a graph, when we projected to the control flow graph, we didn't capture all of the information about where we are in the program. So we need to do a projection, and we need to project to something that's a little bit richer. But we want to make sure we project to something that is just rich enough. Let me, let me illustrate. So if we merge these two nodes at the beginning together, we have an earlier post dominator. And that earlier post dominator means it will propagate fewer taints, and so we'll have less over tainting. So we need to capture something that has both code points and continuations. And it turns out that the proof, all we ended up needing was the stack height. So, and that's easy to calculate from the continuation stack. But we're projecting from abstract continuations, and so we can't always calculate the precise stack height. So we need some sort of abstraction. And this turns out it's easy to do. All we need is the actual stack height if we can calculate it, and if not, a wild card. And then whenever our post dominator is at one of these wild card nodes in our execution point graph, because control flow graph was taken, um, we just say, okay, we'll keep on going, and we find another post dominator. So it's the net, whatever immediate post dominator that doesn't represent potentially infinite nodes. Okay, so prove it. How does the proof work? Well, the proof works in the same way that non-interference works. We're going to start by some program trace, we go someplace, and we branch. And now we're going to envision this as two separate executions, again, with different sensitive values. But because we've branched, we're no, no longer in lockstep. And we'll, we can't just do a, a trivial proof of, you know, by simulation or something like that. We've gone to different places, and we don't know where. But in many cases, we're going to branch and then come right back together. And so what we need to do is we have to have a weakened invariant that allows us to say, at every state in the program, either we have a context taint and we know about it so we can mark things as unsafe, or we're actually in these two executions, we must be in the same place, and therefore, um, because we must be in the same place, we know we're safe. We also know that we've marked everything in memory that is unsafe. And so really, we just have this one similar, or, or so to speak, we have one trace. So what do the results look like? Well, we implemented this, and for 12 of our test bench programs, every one of them timed out after a full day of analysis on our server. OK. So took a look at the complexity. The complexity of this analysis is related. It's a state complexity problem. It's related to the size of the state space, which is the size of each of the sets of the components. Okay, so we've added on two additional uh, components to our state, and the taint store is pretty straightforward. Just maps ab abstract addresses, we already have those, and we're updating the taint store in parallel with the real store. So this is unlikely to be the culprit here. However, since the branch set is exponential in the size of code points, because it's a set of code points, this seems like a likely culprit. So we thought about it, and thought, well, what can we do to improve it? We decided to remove all of this extra machinery and just do an ordinary abstract interpretation. And then add it back in and use our completed state graph and go over that and then do our taint flow analysis. Now, do our taint flow analysis, there we go. So, what is the complexity? It's unchanged. But it's a little bit better in a few ways. One is that when we're creating our, our um, execution point graph, we're doing it from a much smaller state space because we're projecting from a CESK state space and not a CESK TB state space. There's also, um, there are also other potential improvements. We're not propagating spurious in, implicit taints and then removing them, and that those, those spurious taints could actually contribute to additional interpretation work, which we don't have to do because of this. Um, and it, it actually, we have intermediate results available that we can work on, we can start looking at, and it allows us to kind of, kind of separate things. And this line of thought also led us to some exciting future work. 
That is, if we want to apply this to a different language at present, what we have to do is develop an entirely new CESK TB <laughs> machine and prove that it's correct. But if we're separating the abstract interpretation phase from the taint flow phase, we potentially will be able to write simply a new abstract interpreter for the language, which we would need to do anyway, and then use the results from this interpreter, feed it into the same taint flow mechanism, and get a proof without additional theoretical work. And I believe that this is possible to do even on languages that include things like call CC or like crazy expressive languages. If you can write an abstract interpreter, I believe it's possible to get this proof for free, which is great. So with this updated thing, what do the results look like in our new version? Well, they're better. For the 12 applications, five of them give us results that are correct results, right? No, no false negatives. Um, and in some cases, reasonable false positive percentages uh, within a day. And uh, we're, we're still working to improve this. So this is, this is still a work in progress, but it is a work that has progressed. Thank you. I'm ready for questions.